Welcome to another episode of the Y Factor. Today With is Thursday, the 23rd of February for 2012. With Muhammad, Rashwani, and Jamal on the mic. It has been an absolute huge weekend, guys, seriously. It the Y massive. Factor launch. It was absolutely massive. It was a huge success. You know, we got so many positive uh, comments on the Facebook page and, you know, from Mashallah. emails. Mashallah. Yeah. You know, I'm going to throw the Lebo in and say there's a thousand people in attendance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, millions. Yeah, there was, there was uh, about 320 to be yeah. exact. That was a good number. Well, there, there was about actually 340, I heard, especially wow. considering uh, we were only planned for 250. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, it was really crazy what happened. More than half the people stayed for more than half an hour after the event actually finished everybody stayed all the way up until the end yeah yeah most panelists stayed past an hour yeah back just chatting to the audience even wow. the board stayed all the way up until the end and they yeah. don't they never stay till the end exactly like, yeah. so uh, you know the, the more older people were saying you know i feel young again things like that if you stay till <laughs> fajr i would have stayed yeah. you know it's so suspension of disbelief <laughs> three hours you're young but yeah, when you go yeah. back home you're an old man exactly it was, it was, it was but it was a tough night. Oh, what man. time did we leave? We left around uh, uh, midnight. We, we left at midnight, and we were yeah. hungry after that. So yeah, we yeah. hit up McDonald's. We, 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 we <laughs> grab a snack. Woke up oh, the next man. day on a halal hangover. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Having <laughs> gone through chaos for ourselves, but alhamdulillah, you know, alhamdulillah, we pulled Look, through. The, in all honesty, there were some some you know technical glitches Pick on up. the night. A random chandelier that almost collapsed. Like, <laughs> yeah, what, where, what where does that happen that? except in Granville? <laughs> the sake, the microphones that just didn't like us. You know, they're anti-Muslim. I'm telling you. Okay, you know what? Yeah, you public, the public, uh, public explanation as to why exactly the mics stuffed up to that extent. Because as uh, a friend of ours would know, one of the volunteers, Tabi, who I'd like to shout out to, he was a champion on the night. Um, as we were working on them during the day, we turned on, say, four at once, and we tested them out, worked perfectly. Um, however, what we did not do was test out ten at once, not thinking, well, four at once, you know, if they worked, why would ten be any different? So, um, as we soon discovered when we switched them all on, was that they don't like each other. Yeah. <laughs> they just, they were like, oh, Racial no. discrimination. And yeah, yeah. They were, as soon as you put them close, they were like magnets. They just wanted to fly away. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah, it but was. we fixed all that up by yep, halfway, yep, and did. everybody loved the event by the end of it. So, even though it was chaos for us as organizers, people actually really enjoyed it. So, alhamdulillah, yeah, man. Really for good. all those who didn't come, you missed out. You, you, you certainly did, did honestly. But yeah, don't worry, because we're going to be, we're going to be getting even bigger and better and yeah. have more awesome events coming up yeah. in the coming maybe years. it'll Look, be an annual the, if, if the demand that's right I, th- I think if the demand is there I wouldn't mind hosting an annual sort of Y Factor dinner but yeah, make yeah. it the most oh, dynamic mate, dinner that yeah, anyone's yeah. been to it'll you know? be after learning all the stuff that we learned from this dinner it'll be Fan bloody tastic! It will be unbelievable. It'll, It'll be, be up there with the greatest events you've ever seen. Oh, mate! So you know, I'm looking forward to our next event, and plus we'll have a lot more uh, lead up time to that as well. So yeah. you know, and there'll you be no more lapels. lapels that's it. Up, oh my! By gosh. the way, advice to anyone who's ever doing a live show: don't use lapels. Yeah, yeah don't do that. We actually got See, told that. Funny thing is, guys, we found this after the event. After the event, yeah, yeah. From the guys so who gave us a lapel, yeah, mic, yeah, conveniently yeah. telling us yeah, after the event. Like, oh, what, what, what event were you doing? And I was like, oh, you know, we we doing a live kind of game show. Oh, you don't use lapels for that. Oh, no way. Thanks, Einstein, for telling us at the start. Yeah. Massive rant to worthy Saved of that us. one. Oh, the mate. hour of e-bashing we I gave us the right. audience. Right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, moving on to the news for this week. Headlines, you reckon? Let's go for it. Let's get straight into it. The Y Factor is proudly brought to you by Flames Steakhouse Pizza and Ribs in Campsie, the best steak you'll ever have. Mohammed, take it away. The Y Factor. In international news, the Red Cross in Beirut, Lebanon has called for a daily two-hour ceasefire in Syria so that it can deliver emergency aid and reach people who are wounded or sick, an appeal that has come as activists said 50 people were killed nationwide, including 13 government shellings against the resistance stronghold of Homs. Activists said the intense shelling of Baba Ammar in Homs lasted a few hours but did not seem to be the start of a widely expected military offensive aimed at retaking rebel-held neighbourhoods in the central region. At least two of the 16 people killed were children, activists said, warning that Homs is already facing a humanitarian catastrophe. At least six people have died after shots were fired during violent protests in Afghanistan against the burning of Qur'ans at a NATO base. The angry protests were sparked after charred copies of the Qur'an were found by Afghan labourers at the Bagram Air Base near Kabul on Tuesday. The Afghan Interior Minister blamed a US military base in eastern Kabul, which was attacked by the protesters. In Kabul and around the country, furious Afghans took to the streets, screaming, death to America, while throwing rocks 
arrests and setting fire to shops and vehicles. The United States Embassy in Kabul has placed staff in lockdown. A Palestinian member of an Islamic militant group, Qaeda Adnan, has agreed to end his 66-day hunger strike to protest his imprisonment without charge after reaching a deal with Israel that will free him in April. Yesterday's announcement ended a tense standoff that left the 33-year-old Qaeda Adnan clinging to life and drew international attention to a controversial Israeli policy of holding suspected Palestinian militants without charge. The award-winning Sunday Times journalist Mari Colvin has been killed in Syria. It is reported that she died alongside a French photographer in Homs when a house they were staying at was shelled. News agencies say that she and the photographer Remy Ochlek, another veteran war correspondent, were killed by a rocket as they tried to make their escape. A US television crew had filmed the first footage shot inside one of Apple's most infamous Chinese iPad and iPhone factories. 18 workers have committed suicide at the Foxconn factory amid accusations of forced overtime, underage labor and fatal chemical explosions. According to the US news channel, it takes 365 pairs of hands, 5 days and 141 steps to assemble an iPad and many workers never get to see the finished product. In lighter news, the French government has decreed the honorific Mademoiselle should be phased out from official forms. They have considered it to be unnecessary and an unjustified reference to a woman's marital status. After a campaign by feminist groups, the French Prime Minister's office has issued a circular saying the Mademoiselle option should be removed from all administrative documents in the vast state bureaucracy. In local news, former PM Kevin Rudd has resigned from his post as Foreign Minister after months of speculations that he was preparing to challenge Prime Minister Julia Gillard. In Kevin Rudd's resignation speech, he cited that he cannot continue as Foreign Minister if he does not have the Prime Minister's support and he believes that it was the only honourable course of action to take. Less than an hour after Kevin Rudd gave a press conference in Washington DC declaring he was the best person to lead the Labour Party to the next election, Prime Minister Julia Gillard has issued a challenge to Kevin Rudd to give the same undertaking, seeking to lock the former Foreign Minister into a one-shot strategy. Ms Gillard has accused Mr Rudd of a long-running destabilisation campaign and said that while Mr Rudd had been an excellent campaigner in 2007, the government had descended into paralysis because of his chaotic and dysfunctional work patterns. Sam Ismail, a former Granville Boys High School student, was killed when the car he was travelling in crashed into a home on Cumberland Road, Auburn, just after midnight last night. A 17-year-old P-plater was driving the Mitsubishi Magna erratically down Park Road in Auburn when he nearly collided with a police vehicle. The police officer swerved and performed a U-turn before initiating a pursuit. It lasted less than a minute and progressed into back streets where the officer lost sight of the car. Seconds later, the police located the car on Cumberland Road and again lost sight of it briefly before it collided with a Mazda sedan at the intersection of Albert Road. A Passenger in the rear end of the Mitsubishi died at the scene and three others were taken to hospital with various injuries. Adelaide High School students are being forced to learn in hallways and told to remain off campus during study breaks because of overcrowding. Council members last week toured the popular West Terrace campus and were shown areas where students were being taught in areas which were not designated classrooms, including landings. That's the news making headlines for this week. I'm Mohammed. Back to you, boys. Man, Jamal, that is a massive week of news, eh? That's right, but right before you get into your rant, Rashwani, I have a bit of a problem. I just got myself uh, a smartphone the other day, and mm-hmm. you've got this market full of all these different apps, right? Yep. But every single app asks you for all these different permissions, and it's it's opening you up to all these security risks. It's asking what? you, you know, it's going to give you access to your contacts, your the pit, the photos that you take, wow. you know, all these different, you know, really getting into your personal life. They can even access your personal emails and Facebook if they so choose to. What? But obviously, they they give you that sort of guarantee. What, quote kind, of, what kind of app? See the downloading there, Jamel. Well, anything like a flashlight or a, you know an audio editor. Really, anything really. And they're all asking for those kind of details. That's amazing. Yeah. That's like what are they going to use it for? I don't know. But oh well, actually, I know they use it for advertising. They use it for market research. 
It's like what Facebook does, right? So Facebook, to get to know your, your audience. Exactly, exactly. What Facebook does basically is that when you go onto the site and you accept their terms and conditions, if you read it, because I started it in contracts, Muhammad, you would too, um, that if you read it, you'd actually see that the details that you give them, for example, your age, which is very important, mm. your likes and dislikes, the movies you like, the music you like, the, the um, photos that you put up, things like that, that's recorded in their database forever. So even if you delete your account? Even if you delete it, it's still there. It's still recorded within their database. You know what? That is a... That's, they sell it. That's a brilliant bit of. That's a brilliant idea. No, it's a brilliant bit of. You know what? For business. everyone out there for who deleted research. their Facebook account thinking they're off the online world. Yeah, no, nah, it's still there, still there. It's still on, technically speaking, and your information is being sold to different yeah. marketers. And well, what, what if somebody yeah. actually makes a uh, like for those who haven't got a Facebook profile? What if somebody makes a fake one of you and acts like you? Over the net, well, isn't it better to have a Facebook profile for yourself? Yeah, that's true. I believe. Well, I personally believe that it's better to have a Facebook profile only because it's good for connections. Yeah, it's good to know what information. You are putting on there it helps with events as well. You know, and yeah, the world, yeah. like the world events, the Arab Spring, for goodness sake, was yeah, circulated yeah. Oh, via Facebook. So yeah. if we ever want a mutiny on a national scale in Australia, yeah. anarchy, just Facebook, exactly, create a Facebook right? page. There's, there's anarchy, more than, <laughs> anarchy day. There's yeah, more than no. 10 million Aussies on Facebook. So wow, you know, yeah. Well, look at the London riots. London riots as well. I mean, there's good and there's bad. The London riots were caused by Facebook and spreading around. I, I think there's so much benefit to social media. I think, especially the Muslim community, unfortunately, our leaders place a lot of emphasis and don't get me wrong I'm not downplaying there's a lot of fitna out there a lot of fitna online mm-hmm. but if you use it for the right reasons as Sheikh Wissam Chikawa was saying at the launch mm-hmm. it's what you use it for you can of exploit course. it for the wrong reasons you can exploit it for the right reasons and there's a lot of potential there for, for yeah. great things to happen yeah you have a lot of Muslims on, on there who use it for very uh, productive purposes in the Muslim community mm. either with um, raising awareness about different events or different causes yeah, or yeah. different fundraising dinners yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of um, I mean for a fact we use it for, for for some sharing. I mean, too. our Facebook page. How much is it now? One thousand and fifty-five. Yeah, Amazing. growing every day. We should really be getting paid for for all this plugging by Facebook. Yeah, we I should. Hey, let's call let's, Mark. Let's call Mark and and you know <laughs> yeah. have Yo, a chat all, to him. Well, let's yeah. all the bad things that Facebook does, Mr. like Zuckerberg. the annoying changes and oh yeah. my I god, I like and the excessive change. sharing. Do I. They should have just left it as it was, man. Yeah. It was good, and then now it's and all the 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 like pages that we used to make before. And you used to be able to message your members to let them know. Yeah, yeah. Now it's all gone. And like half the groups you used to join, they're not really there, but they and are there. there's a limit. Like there's a cap on how many groups and you, you can join. And you don't know how much that cap is. It's and like, yeah, what, it's ridiculous. On, like you, you delete yourself from four groups to join one and it still says, no, no, you're part of too many groups. Oh, man. Yeah, and yeah. It, uh, oh, actually, you I get a really billion story. notifications as well unless you actually change your settings. I actually have a really good story uh, with Facebook, right? I was on Facebook the other day and having a conversation with someone about Palestine. And uh, we were discussing Gaza and what was going to happen there and how we can fix it. And then we, right in the middle of my conversation, as I pressed enter to send a message, it said, a little thing popped up going, there has been an error, please resend. I said, oh, okay, that's a bit weird. So I typed that out again, pressed it again, and the same message came up, there's been an error, please resend. I go, what's going on? And then I pressed refresh, and then the page went, eh, and then it went, um, you have been logged out of Facebook, your account has been deleted because of suspect uh, a, a phishing scam. What? What? Or something like Shwani, that. what are you up to? I was like, I was, Fishing PH, people. Yeah, PH, yep. I, I was completely shocked. I go, oh, wow, that was kind of rude. I just cut off that person. I received the message within one second going from that person going, I just got deleted off Facebook as well. What? Wow. The? Yeah, yeah. As we were discussing Palestine, jump back on. Had to had to go through a couple of different uh, tasks to go back onto Facebook, and yeah, apparently. Is, is there a Facebook well, call center? Zuckerberg, the the uh, yeah, actually, founder of yeah, Facebook yeah. himself, is Jewish, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I mean, but honestly, perhaps if there was a bro call, call center, and we'd be yeah, making complaints like, like, like we do to Vodafone. I imagine we make complaints like we do to Vodafone. Yeah, I doubt that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's really, really suspect that two people got deleted at the same time discussing the same thing in one conversation. That's just I think we should do an entire episode on Facebook for goodness sake. But the conspiracy, out of the Illuminati, the, the triangle. out of time. You know what, Jamal? There's so much stuff to talk about this week. And who better to hate on the world than our man Rashwani? Begin your rant. Well, thanks, boys, for that overly dramatic uh, introduction. It's just uh, me yelling into the microphone. We oh. thought you deserved it. You oh, do okay. indeed, Jam- mm, Rashwani. <laughs> Jam- <laughs> Get his name right. If you're going to be working with, if you're going to be working with the team, you got to get our names right. My apologies, Tasneem. It's, it's, it's not Tas. Okay, never mind. You know what? Begin your rant. Yeah, yeah. I give up with. Go, Rishwani. Please, silence. Okay. Now, to our listeners, 
as everyone has uh, understood, uh, Kevin Rudd is uh, ex Prime Minister Kevin Rudd is now gunning for the Prime Ministership seat, that being the seat Julia Gillard is currently sitting up upon. And um, well, to be honest, this has been going on for quite a while, and I think that this has become beyond ridiculous. Like this is. When a group of people come together and decide, you know what, we're going to run something, an organization. Let's just look at something simple like a youth organization. They sit down and go, we're going to run something. We're going to have a leader. Okay, who's our leader? The tall bloke. The tall bloke is our leader. Okay, what kind of group, when they're, they're looking towards benefiting their group, you know, working towards the benefit of their group, we sit down and go, you know what? That guy there, that tall guy, I don't want him to be the leader anymore. I want the short guy to be the leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Short guy, do you want to be the leader? No. Yeah, yeah, you want to be the leader. Do you want to be the leader? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically what's happening. We have two, one leader that wasn't supposed to be there in the first place and a leader who was meant to be in the first place that nobody likes. Do you know what's become now like? They've, the, the competition for the seat has become similar to when we were in primary school and we had to pick out teams for handball and everyone had to stand in a line and the two captains had to stand and go, you first, Mohammed, Ahmed. Whatever, whatever. That's what it's become. It's become primary school, schoolyard politics. Wow. Unbelievable. It's just like, how hard is it to come to a decision on what leader you, you're going to be having, you know? You look at liberals. Liberals have one leader, Tony Abbott. Okay, fine. He's a bit of a, you know, <laughs> he has problems. But they've decided on their leader. That's their leader. They're going with it. They'll be like, you know, we're stuck with him. Let's do it. These guys, well, Kevin decided, oh, you know, I, I don't like the way Julia is running things. Julia is like, oh, my God, please get me out of this. And... It's absolutely ridiculous. You know, we've got so many problems in the country. We have the financial uh, problems. We have international. We've got soldiers here, soldiers there. We don't know what's going on. And what's the news focused on? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Julia Gillard is, is going to go and Kevin Rudd is going to come in. Oh, <laughs> man. Just get over it. We need you. Like they said, um, it's going to finish on Monday. On Monday, they're going to have the ballot and the, pr the ministers are finally going to stop their backbiting and the backroom politics and their whatever else they're going. Everyone goes to their own radio station and goes, oh, I hate Kevin Rodwa. I hate Julia Gillard. We don't care. We we don't care anymore. Just we run just, the country properly. Thank you. That's it. We just want you to finish this up so we can start moving on to the things that matter. You know, what happened to the carbon tax? All gone. We don't hear about it anymore because of this. What happened to the the, the public miners? Public transport. And public transport. And what happened to all the, the wars that are going on? The financial crisis. What happened to our budget? What happened to everything? Elections coming up. None of that is important anymore. And don't people still have a problem that there's a ranger as our prime minister? Uh, yeah, that's another... Oh, wait. That's kind of similar to what we're talking about. But let's not go there. <laughs> Okay. But that's that's my point. There's so many problems going on, and everyone's just focused now on how Julia Gillard is going to lose her prime ministership or might lose her prime ministership to Kevin Rudd. And now we're stuck with this until Monday. This is just, man, it makes me want to tear my hair out. It's just, like e I said, easy, Rashwani. Schoolyard politics. It's a disgrace to Australia, and it's a disgrace to politics. Well, hang on a second. I read an article yesterday where Kevin Rudd was saying that he's not going for prime minister's role. Really? Where'd you read that? Why would you ask me that question? Do you because want a link? It matters. I mean, daily do you want a URL link? Link. Yeah, actually, it, it, it was in the news. Tabloid. It was in the news. I love a URL link. But nonetheless, <laughs> my point is that that is an absolute load of rubbish. First of all, there is much evidence of the fact that Kevin Rudd loves the foreign minister job. Why do we know that? Because he's never in the country. Secondly, <laughs> second. Fair enough. Se no, but it is true. It's actually a known fact that Kevin Rudd loves international politics. One of his biggest goals um, as prime minister was to get us on the Security Council in the UN. That's his thing. That's his little niche, you know? So he loves the foreign minister job. For him to quit it, I thought that was a big call. Why he quit it? Very simple. He quit it to come back to Australia to focus on challenging for the prime ministership, challenging for the leadership. Because while he's overseas, it's hard. You know, how are you going to gather ministers if you're not sitting there face to face going, please, bro, here's 200 bucks, follow me. You know? That's, <laughs> that's I mean, no. no, no. So, like so, so you're saying he lied, he lied to the press that I'm he's not coming he back? i because he manipulated the press. Because he was also saying that, you know, to you know he's he has no interest in coming back but until Murder. the Labour team actually changes and the men, the men behind, yeah, you know. Yeah, he said that, those men. But you know why he said that? There is actually known proof that the caucus, those being all the prime ministers that you know go, 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 behind Julia Gillard and say nothing, they hate him. They hate him because he crushed their backroom politics as prime minister, and he was very nitpicky. He wouldn't allow them to just go ahead and make their own little decisions. He would make every decision for them, and they really hated that because that involved him in all of their own personal, not personal, but more political kind of games. You know, he kind of crushed their political. So games. he stamped so that out when he was prime minister. He basically stamped that out. Now, why? So that was why they took such dr drastic action and got rid of him. 
Because remember, at one point, he was the most popular prime minister in history. Why would they get rid of him? Because they really, really, really dislike him. They dislike he, how he works and how he, he goes about things. So it's a conspiracy, I think. It's not necessarily a conspiracy. It's, it's simple politics. They did not like his, uh, his blockages that he was putting in, so they removed him. But the question is, right, now we've gotten to a point where it, the caucus dislikes him, but he's got to have the caucus support. So the numbers currently stand, you need to get, each, each uh, Julia Gillard or Kevin Rudd must get over 50 ministers, I think it was 50 or 60 ministers, um, support. Actually, I think it was 40. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and uh, both of them are on the 30 mark. However, Julia Gillard has come out and said, no, no, she's on 60. I have a feeling that extra 30 are more undecided. They're just obviously with her because she's the current prime minister. So what's your verdict, Rishwani? What do you think is going to happen? To be honest, it's really, really difficult. I mean... Uh, to be a complete, I dislike the topic, but if I wanted a real uh, answer on it, it's difficult because, like I said, the public love Kevin Rudd. That's a known thing. And, in fact, Kevin Rudd is probably the one reason Labor will win the next election, if they do. Like, that's it. Well, it's especially because their they're only competitor is bloody Abbott. You know? yeah, yeah, right, exactly. But, however, Abbott is in pole position now, right? So there's only one thing that will save Labor, and that is Kevin Rudd. But, as I stated earlier, the caucus ministers really, really, really dislike him. So it's... it's, it's I mean, it's a really interesting time for politics, but it's also a really annoying time for the media. For those who don't know, what are, who are the caucus ministers? So the caucus are all the backbench ministers, all the ministers that vote on things. So we've got the front bench, which is, you know, everyone we know. All the, 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 really, the really important ones. Yeah, yeah the yeah. figureheads, the one that we see on the news, right? But those aren't all the ministers. All the ministers, there's, there's around uh, 60 or 70 of them, yeah. just from Labor, right? So all the rest of them, not the front bench, all the rest of them that sit up there and they gobble, 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 gobble in question and answer time, those are the backbench. Those are the caucus. Those are the people that need, that want the prime minister to change or not change, whatever so that, they want. their decision will have influence. They're, yep, they're the decision. And they look after all different sorts of sections of government. Right, right. So, you know, when you vote... Running the country. Yep. So, when you vote for a minister um, uh, at the voting polls, when you vote, you vote, for example, Labour or Liberal. So, you vote Labour or whatever and you get your own Labour minister, right? But he doesn't necessarily cover a certain area. So, like Wayne Swan is our um, treasurer, etc., etc. He might just be in the backbench. Well, he doesn't have a specific responsibility, but his vote is very important. You voted him in there to give him your to give your voice to him. Do you know what I mean? Mm. He is your voice in the caucus, so he will vote according to how you know he feels that your area will go for. So, so that's generally how it works. So Gilly Abbey Ruddy, who's going to win the next election? Well, if Rudd gets in, Rudd 100% will win the next election. I will bet anything on that. You Things know why? Even on a smaller scale, everyone at the Y Factor launch voted for Rudd as preferred PM. But, well, I uh, prefer him as PM. I do actually, but I don't like his backroom politics. He he prevents a lot of things going on, and he's just pedantic. He's pedantic, and he f- he's focused on international politics. Although idealistic, it's not really ideal to uh, an Australian prime ministership. Sure. What, what what about his policies in regards to the Muslim community because I guess that's our main one of the things concern. he did was that he didn't really bother us which is good I mean you know n- neither does Gilad yeah. to be honest but the whole Muslim community thing is more of a state issue I mean if you talk to me about Barry Farrell then yes we do have a bit of a problem with him or no yeah. problems with him but Kevin Rudd never really bothered us I mean he had he took positive steps on the refugees on um, the, the uh, uh, position in Iraq apologised to the Aborigines he apologised he did a lot of good things yeah. Julia Gillard did a fair amount of good things I mean she introduced carbon tax whether you get in for it or not um, and she's trying to push through a couple of changes. But, but she still stabbed her right in the back. She Well, that's another thing. Did she? No, she did not, actually. She was pushed into it. The okay. honest truth was that the, the, the faceless men that he was speaking about, yep. those faceless men are the ones that removed him. They are the ones, like I said, they... The d- Illuminati. No, no. Well, you know, I can actually <laughs> tell you one of them. He's um, the sports minister. Um, you might know his name. Why? Uh, oh, Victor Dominello. No, <laughs> I forgot his name. He's like a Arbab or something like that. I really forgot his name, but he's uh, he's kind of bold. He's a sports minister, and he is a massive power broker. He's the guy that uh, one of the guys that pulls the strings, right? Him and his group did not like the way Kevin Rudd is running the country. Not necessarily the way he's running the country. The way he was running the Labour Party. So they decided to remove him against all the indications that he would win the next election. Arishwan, you've got 30 seconds left. Wrap it up. What are you angry about? What do you want to see change? I want the media to stop focusing on Kevin Rudd and Julie Gutt. It's until Monday. There's nothing we can change. Nothing they will say will do anything about that. Just let it go. We'll see you on Monday. Inshallah, this thing will be worked out and we can focus on the future of this country. And hopefully we'll get a leadership 
leadership that actually does us uh, some good yeah does some action some takes some real action Ashwani here's a bottle of water for your rent in <laughs> thanks man and doesn't uh, affect the Muslim community as well well in not yet hopefully way. it never will okay. inshallah it never will inshallah thank you very much Mr. Rashwani for your rant for no this worries. week no worries Guys, do not go anywhere. After the break, we chat to a sister about the ongoing Somali famine crisis and we also managed to lock in an interview with the convert brother over the weekend from the man who changed the world event at the amphitheater at Sydney Olympic Park in front of a thousand people. He stood up and proclaimed the Shahada. We've locked in an interview with him to hear about his amazing experience coming to Islam. So do not go anywhere. You're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM. It would be such a pleasure to have you come along with me. I accept your gracious offer of kindness and company. But as we walk along, young man, and as you help me with my load, I have only one request. As we travel down this road, don't talk to me about Mohammed. Because of him there is no peace and I have trouble in my mind So don't talk to me about Mohammed And as we walk along together we will get along just fine As we walk along together we will get along Welcome back to the Y Factor on 87.6 FM. Moving on to a more serious topic, uh, the crisis in the Horn of Africa, which has affected over 12 million people and is the biggest um, and most severe food crisis in the world today. We don't really hear it much on the media these days, but it still is a massive, massive problem. Yeah. And it's sad. It's unfortunate that if, if it's you know if Somalia or the famine crisis isn't the stop you know sorry the top story um, on TV or the news headlines, no one really cares anymore. I guess yeah. You've got I mean Rudd resigning is more important these days than you know people dying every day in Somalia because they lack food because they don't have any food, and the stories and reports that are still coming out of Somalia are horrific, and yet we st- we don't hear any of it. And I think it's because the media plays that game where it's all about the ratings for them so they don't you know if people get sick of a story because it's been repeated so much even if it's a massive problem they're still just going to put it to the wayside think about iraq and the problems that are still going on there and yet we never hear it in the news anymore absolutely so and and i'm saying this because i actually know um the ceo of uh the abc and he said that like he's a very straightforward very nice guy um you know very down to earth and you know one of the best guys you'll meet and he'll tell you the reason why we don't play it on the news as much and you think abc is fairly balanced he says the reason why we don't play play stories like what's happening in iraq or the middle east or africa so much is because of the whole ratings uh issues and and that's the reality is unfortunately the media has like a profound impact on public opinion because somalia is out of the spotlight and out of the news headlines people don't donate anymore. exactly it's out of people's minds it's they off think their conscious they think it's all the, good yep they think the crisis is over that's right but uh, inshallah we've got a sister in the studio today uh, sister Fatima from Soda who is going to be telling us about what's actually currently happening on the ground uh, with her personal accounts uh, of her time there it's uh, some really interesting stuff so stay tuned for that um, and um, sister Fatima assalamu alaikum firstly and welcome to the program well, Salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for ha- having me. So, it's Sister it's Soda, what's Soda actually stand for? Somali Organization for Development Aid. And you only just came back from there recently? Three months ago, yes. Yeah. So right when the, the main crisis was happening and I guess you, you would still be getting updates from today, you know, what's been happening on the ground there. So can you tell us maybe uh, the reality of the situation because we don't see it in the media anymore? Sure. Uh, I guess uh, the the biggest concern is because it does surround mums, babies and kids who make up 80% of the refugees in famine. That's why we're so concerned because it's... It, look, these things, they don't... Dis- um, the famine doesn't discriminate between man, beast or whatever. But um, as I have mentioned, our concern is the mums, babies and kids. And so they've fled from political unrest, violence... And, of course, the drought. And they are now in famine. And it doesn't go away just because there's a little bit of rain or it drops off the media. So we Mm. need to keep the aid coming through for them. Is soda primarily... Now, you guys were established in 2006. That's correct. Um, What what, what is soda all about primarily? 
Okay, okay. Uh, before the famine, um, before the peak of the famine, if I may say that instead, uh, we were doing AFMAD at primary school, adult literacy programs, Mashallah. agriculture, agriculture, you name it. So, And we're also now doing orphans. Wow. Which is quite important because I guess in Somalia, you've you've obviously from the civil wars, you've got a high orphan rate. For education-wise, you've got about 45% of the country is literate, I think, or illiterate. I can't remember Indeed. the exact... Um, you know, you've got these recurring civil wars, this corruption in, uh, in the government and uh, throughout, which isn't resolved because of the like it, it naturally happens because of the great uh, poverty that exists in Somalia um, I know in some parts of Africa the average salary is ten dollars a year uh, in Somalia I'm not exactly sure how much it is but you know it, it seems like from from the situation of the people on the ground that can't be too far from that you know they they live in very harsh conditions so maybe you can share with us some stories about what you actually experienced when you were in somalia on the ground at the peak of the famine which still hasn't gone away uh, dear listeners is still happening okay uh, as mentioned before i just got back from africa about three months ago uh, we went to oversee the distribution of the 1940 um, foot containers that we sent from here to Kenya and Somalia. And they arrived at a crucial time when everybody else had abandoned the field because of the unstable environment, such as roadside bombings, um, kidnapping of a- other aid workers. You, you said, Grunt, you heard uh, bombs going off not too far from your, your two hotel. From hotel. Two yes. blocks from hotel, Two fun. consecutive nights. Hmm. So a, a lot of people, d- you know, they really don't appreciate how lucky we are here in Australia. We have so much bountiful items of food to choose from. But I must say, it was when you see the look on mums, babies and kids' faces, they've never seen a can of tuna. Some of them have never seen a can of tuna in their whole life. Or Aldi's juice or soft biscuits. And or clean and water. Types. Or clean water as well. Clean water as well. SubhanAllah. Mm. Now, you, you, you've touched on the, the, the conditions that the people on the ground work with, but you were saying earlier off air that it has to be probably one of the most hostile regions in the world. Yes. Political unrest, gun violence, rebels. So on top of the famine crisis, your aid workers have to deal with all of that. Yes. Plus, the harsh, plus the harsh climate as well on top of it. Uh, we actually lost a staff member going back a week and a half ago. He was shot in the back of the head. He was our um, feeding centre um, manager for W Somalia. Left behind a seven-week-year-old um, baby girl as well as a 12-year-old girl and an eight-year-old boy. And these these men know very well that what they do is very dangerous, but they keep striving and pushing ahead for the sake of mums, babies and kids. Mm. So even SubhanAllah, even the, the perception of an aid worker or a charity worker in, in the modern, I guess, the modern context, it's it's a very dangerous gig. You, you can't, you, I, SubhanAllah, like, I'm, I'm very naive. I'm thinking it's just go out there, you know, you're going to have all these little children come at you and you're going to be patting their heads and giving them food and putting a smile on their faces. But they have to deal with all those other factors you're talking about. That's correct. Um, with our distributions, though, uh, we are feeding 3,500 families every week. Mashallah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. So we provide them with a uh, one-week survival kit, mm-hmm. uh, which is made up of 25 to 30 kilos of the basic um, cooking necessities like cooking oil, tomato paste, flour, sugar, tea bags, UHT milk, ugala, which is a white starch um, product, uh, product which is common for the area. But we do that in, within the feeding centres, um, for several reasons. Um, first and foremost, uh, our staff are, expen- are very experienced in doing distributions. Um, we have supervisors who go out into the refugee camps and assess the situations of refugees to seek out the most dire. Um, we don't help people already receiving aid. We help those who are not registered with the UN and not receiving any um, food. So the people who are shelter. probably in the worst uh, of the they worst. They are in the worst um, situations, such as um, the toddler Ibrahim. He came to soda. Uh, he only weighed 3.5 kilos, skin and bone, if you can imagine a two-and-a-half-year-old two who mm. should be weighing at least 15 kilos at that age. Um, passing in and out and consciousness and guess what guys those containers made a huge difference because nobody else was there to help we got a lot of numbers coming in and we gave him Aldi's juice and biscuits from the containers took him straight to the hospital Alhamdulillah 
How how long would uh, you speak about the survival kit? Is, is it a weekly survival kit? That is that well, its longevity. Fine. So what happens after that? Obviously, the, the pressure's on you guys to, to keep it coming consistently. Absolutely, yes. And that requires resources, money. Yes. You know, all the material goods as well. We do accept international donations. Uh, we do like containers um, for a few reasons. First and foremost, um, a lot of the items that come from international aid aren't available for purchase in Africa. Mm. Um, also, countries like Australia, the aid's really good. Why? Because um, in Australia, they have strict regulations that don't allow any foods that are sprayed with banned chemicals. In Africa, there's no accountability. Um, we can we know that from the aid that we take, it's not going to be expired. It's going to be a very good quality food, and it's going to help them with their recovery. Yeah, and well, it sounds like the the workers of soda the, themselves as well really care about um, the the actual people. You know, it's not sort of just about um, serving a certain amount of numbers. It's about you know having this uh, personal connection with seeing the suffering of these people and wanting to to help them. Um, you were actually telling us as well that the danger on the ground is so great that you actually have to go around with armed guards. That's the norm. Yes, who were ordered to. Uh, kill any sort of uh, people who would attack you on site. That's correct. Which is pretty intense. I say. That's very, it's kind of very graphic to what we um, what we expect. Well, in Australia, you know, we, we would never even. Um, I mean, life here. Is, I've travelled a bit around the world. I haven't been to Somalia yet, but I've been to a few third world countries, and you really see this massive contrast between how we live in Australia and how people live over there. It's really it messes with your perception of reality. Yeah, so. yeah, we we take so much for for granted and i think we're so snobbish here because we don't actually think each day or each week that you know i should really set aside this much to save lives overseas which is only takes a few dollars and you really are making a big difference to people overseas mm. um so i guess we wanted to say like the famine hits everybody it doesn't discriminate you were saying so um what how can what can we do to help soda what can we do to help the people on the ground um how can we raise money how much money do you need um in order for the next shipment because you got the fundraising dinner that's coming up inshallah yes tell us uh you know how can we help okay anybody's uh, er, naturally every dollar makes a difference yeah at the moment we're trying to raise enough money to purchase six more aid trucks purpose of those trucks is to transport um <coughs> our containers some 475 kilometres from Port Mombasa wow. to our first feeding centre. Uh, generally, that would be a cost of $1,700. Yeah. But we want to eliminate that cost because our attitude is every dollar goes into feeding. Yeah. Um, you know, Mashallah. That's babies. a great, great yeah. principle. Yeah. Um, it's not just that. That's not the only purpose of the trucks. Also, um, for women who are making that long journey, who are, you know, families who are making that long journey, we also would like to transport them from the border to the nearest um, refugee camps and also to um, provide an income to keep feeding the people as well. And we just wanted to make it loud and clear. You've, you've made mention off air that um, the crisis on the ground is a lot worse than is reported on mainstream media, even though it's sort of off the, the main headlines of today. Um, the, the next dry season is in May, and yes. you guys are preparing for that? We're preparing for May. Do you predict that the media, I guess the media headlines surrounding Somalia will hit come the dry season? Uh, with the media, if they if they find good ratings, then that's <laughs> <they'll come back. laughs> it's very unfortunate. It's the sad but true true reality, isn't it? But uh, so, but I guess you guys uh, part of your campaign over here, and as you were saying, it's very difficult for females to be on the ground in Somalia yes. for for the reasons you mentioned earlier, is creating awareness. Um, propagating campaigning so um, inshallah you know media organizations can take heed of what's really happening and report because we need more coverage more documentaries we need more coverage um, of the graphic situation in Somalia absolutely uh, we do actually record all of our distributions and for large sponsors we provide a copy of that for them on DVD and we also like to meet with different influential people in different countries to bring some awareness and try to gain some more support for the mums, babies and kids in famine. And for our listeners out there, just to give you an idea of how, I guess, hostile the region is 
um, where Sister Fatima and her aid workers are working. How many kidnappings did you witness when you were there, Sister? Uh, I know of 16 different kidnappings while I was there. I didn't witness them. But from guarded hotels, you said, that yes, people were actually are, take. You get a lot more than safari when you go to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess just to contrast uh, for people, the last major famine was in the early 1990s, and you had over 300,000, some reports say over 500,000 Somalis who actually, who actually died from starvation. Um, and reports are actually saying that this famine is a lot worse uh, but we don't hear about it in the media so uh, sister maybe you can give us one personal experience to wrap it up for people to really you know give them an idea of what's happening on the ground um, before we mention the fundraising dinner for everybody to come down to sure uh, I, I guess so people could really grasp the reality of the numbers of those hit in the famine if you can imagine half the population of australia that really hits you home it's home to everybody um but it's not just the famine it's also medical illnesses such as harlequin's baby we have um, five um, children that come to our feeding center soda we provide them with medicines as well harlequin's ichthyosis or harlequin's baby is a very rare genetic disorder or i would like to refer to as scallion split skin mm. and because most of our resources are going into feeding the 3500 families and to keep that steady aid coming through, uh, we really need as much support as we can get to help these children. The Y Factor. And Harlequin's uh, baby, the, dis- the disease itself, can you tell us what it actually is? What, what's the, the symptoms or, you know? Sure. If you can imagine um, your skin and it's dry and it's split and it's scaly, imagine growing six months of skin and one day oh my God. and having to be shaved down every day in order to give you some sort of relief we were looking at some some of the images uh, on google image search about harlequin's baby disease and it looks horrific like uh, almost like an alien mm. uh, alien like disorder yeah yeah. Mm. yeah google that for our listeners if you want to get an idea of how and, graphic it is and you said in somalia you like this is a very rare disorder and yet the people you know in Somalia, out of the ones that you look after, you have five of these cases. Five, five kids and one adult. What's the cause of the disease? Genetic disorder. So, And that would perhaps come about due to uh, bad nutrition throughout uh, generations. Ma- and uh, Absolutely. Um, malnutrition and all those factors, a diet, they yeah. all play a role in, in illnesses. Now, for our listeners, tomorrow night, inshallah, um, at 6 p.m. at Westella, Soto is holding their fundraising dinner for mums and babies. Yep. Inshallah. It's sisters only. Yep. But not just mums, but all, all the girls come down and enjoy a great night of a three course meal. Uh, there's auctions and prizes, lots of hasanat to be involved, inshallah. Help Soda, help Somalia with their famine recovery projects. Um, support mums and babies in Somalia and Kenya. And what you can do is there's uh, plenty of high ticket items such as a spa um, ticket to. Queensland or the Gold yeah, Coast? There was one of those. Brothers can actually bid on that for, yeah. for their wives. Um, um, and this isn't a free excuse for the brothers not to <laughs> attend. You need to send your sisters, your wives, your daughters, your mothers cashed up with cashed up wallets, inshallah. And let them have a good night out. Do something good for, for this year, inshallah, or for this month, actually. Call Sister Fatima on 0422 727 726 to book a ticket. That's 0422 can they also buy tickets at the door at the Grand West Ah, uh, Yes, we all have tickets available at the door. Yep. Or you can send your bundles of hundreds. Yeah, <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. If you want to donate as well, call that number again, 0422 That's tomorrow night, 6 p.m. till 11 p.m. at the Grand West Stella, a Somalia fundraising dinner. Now, finally, what website can they go to to find out more about soda? www.soda.org.au uh, we're currently working on a new site, so... Jazakallah. Yeah. Yeah. Sister site. Fatima, Zakhlaou Khairan, for yeah. that yeah. timely reminder and shedding light on a very sort of important issue that's it's left part, mainstream yeah, media. Exactly. This is important for the whole Ummah that we should be worrying about uh, what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Somalia. Absolutely. Zakhlaou Khairan, sister, for your time. Don't go anywhere. After the break, we chat to the young brother who embraced Islam at the epic The Man Who Changed the World event. You're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM.
He's misled all the weak ones and the poor ones and the slaves. They think they've all found wealth and freedom following his ways. He's corrupted all the youth with his twisted brand of truth. Convinced them that they all are strong, giving them somewhere to belong. So don't talk to me about Muhammad. Because of him there is no peace and I have trouble in my mind So don't talk to me about Mohammed And as we walk along together we will get along just fine As we walk along together we will get along Welcome back to the Y Factor on 87.6 FM. Something that happened apart from the awesome Y Factor launch on the weekend was when the world changed, which I missed out on because of all the planning. Tell me about it, Mohammed, because you went. Yeah, and I had the fortunate opportunity to go to the man who changed the world when the world changed part two um, on the Saturday night. I missed out on the Friday night because we were obviously planning yep. like yep. crazy for the, the Y Factor launch. Alhamdulillah, on the Saturday night, um, it was an epic night. I was there for about the last two hours of the show. And the most powerful scene would have to have been, um, I think it was Luhaydan or Shatri doing dua for about 15 minutes straight. Wow. Did they have the translation for that? or No, they didn't actually. Yeah. I, I maybe think, on, maybe I think on the, the person translating was crying as well. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was in tears. Well, like, maybe on the DVD. Was in tears. Yeah. It was wow, such an yeah, emotional, subtle. spiritual moment. Mm-hmm. Just saying Amin. And even if you didn't understand the Arabic, it was just the, the atmosphere at the yeah, time. Yeah, for sure. And what honestly cap, like, capped off the night was a brother at the end who um, converted to Islam. Mark Evans, was Mark it? Mark Evans, yeah. That young brother who had the you know the courage to get up in front of thousand odd people, in front of two of the greatest reciters in the world and, you know, proclaim the Shahada. Mashallah, man. Well, we've got him in the studio, ladies and gentlemen. So if you want to hear from Mark Evans and his story about how he came to Islam and how when the world change affected him, he's in the studio right now. Welcome to the show, Mark Evans, or Adnan, as we should call you now, right? Oh, wait, no, we should say salamu alaykum first. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> how are you, bro? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Not too wow, bad. Wow, he's learned the lingo already. <laughs> well done. Alhamdulillah, good work. Yeah, just mo- moving a bit, Mark. Now, you're 17 years of age. You're in year 12 at Birong Boys High School. Mashallah. Yeah. Um, it's predominantly, there's a lot of Muslims, I'm assuming, in, in Birong. Yeah, there is. There is? Do you have a lot of Muslim friends? Not, not all the best Muslims, I think, from yeah, personal experience. Yeah, that's a experience. stereotype. No, that's a stereotype. <laughs> Mark, do you want to elaborate? Like, there's some good Muslims at Birong. Yeah, at there Biron. are some good Muslims. Alhamdulillah, that's all right. Yeah? yeah? But anyway, so you were telling us your story before the show about how it, it was uh, sort of a, a course in your life where you went from um, being an atheist to a Christian then being an atheist again, and then, I guess... You know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. We want to hear from you. Yeah. I well, growing up, I was an atheist. I, I didn't like. I felt happy with my life, but there was nothing fulfilling my life. I felt like I had more of a purpose to like get to, and then so I, I like I started looking for religion, and I found Christianity. And then, like at the start, it felt good, but like there was things that contradicted itself in it. So yeah, I decided to become atheist again after about a year and a half. And then, after about five more months or so, I started look. I started looking again. I started hanging out with some religious Muslims, and they just like guided me, uh, gave me books to read and stuff. And everything was like making sense to me. So yeah, I decided to revert to Islam. Oh man. Well, what what was the turning point? Like when I mean, you told us that you were s- intending to become a Muslim um at some stage, but I guess on that night, you know, can you tell us what you were actually feeling? Tell, you know, you were saying it was amazing, amazing feeling. So yeah, tell us about that. Like it was just amazing. Like some brothers gave me like the advice to do it to cuz if everyone's there, like Allah will help me keep my iman strong. So I decided to do it there rather than do it in like a smaller area. Hmm. Yeah. So j- but you see, you're telling us four days before, like you were convinced that you wanted to become a Muslim. Yeah, I was convinced. Like everything was right. Every ma- everything made sense to me. So decided. Yeah, I was going to become Muslim. But about four days before I actually reverted. So tell us about the event itself. Like you know, what, what were your feelings when you were there? Um, tell us about because a lot of some a lot of our listeners may not have gone to the event. And I didn't go as well. So if you can tell me a bit about it, you know, how, how it made we'll you feel. We'll start off with before, yeah. Right before you got up there on stage and you told um, Mr. Zeld, you know, to make the announcement, 
What were you thinking before? What was going through your mind? Uh, I had this happy feeling, but I was incredibly nervous, especially when like everyone had put, turned and put their eyes on me. Just an, uh, just an incredible feeling. That's fine. How about when you were uh, on stage? Oh, wait, before that, what about okay. during the show, actually? Oh, when during you the show, uh, it was an amazing show. Was, the atmosphere was absolutely crazy. Like, I've never experienced that before. What, what sort of feelings were? I, I don't know, my heart, just turned my heart. Like made it open? Yeah, open up, yeah. And was it like a positive uh, feeling Yeah, watching the show? Everything was positive with was the show. It, was there anything like particular, uh, like was a particular part of the show that really affected you the most? Or? Yeah, there was one of the songs, I think it was the one, uh, Don't Talk To Me About Muhammad. So, uh, that, that song really like was... Uh, made me feel good inside. Mashallah. Maybe we can play that song if uh, if we can find track that down. Yeah, it's a famous Nasheed. We'll, we'll try and get onto that. All so, right. so you are, so this is all your feelings before, right? Yeah. And then Mohammed Zaud got up there, the MC on the mic, and said, you know, and do you, you do realize that that it was the most emotional part of the night that you were getting up on? Like a thousand people, a lot of people were in tears because they just made that 15 minute, you know, So you're going to make them cry even more. Even by more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if you think thought the sister, sisters ran out of tissues, they were, you know, getting reinforcements <laughs> because there was a lot of snot that night on hijabs <laughs> and chilbabs. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, got up, you got up there on stage. Um, what was going through your mind? Uh, everything was going through my mind. It was just nervous, just felt right. Every like, just I knew. Never experienced anything like it. It's fun. It's incredible. And how about the uh, the swarm of beaded brothers yeah. <laughs> that embraced <laughs> that you scary? at the end? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was amazing, but yeah, it was kind of scary. At first, I didn't realize what was going on. <laughs> and they were just hugging me, and it was like, continue hugging for about 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, 10 minutes of hugging. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you've ever done that in your life before. <laughs> I'm telling you, that, that's the brotherhood, man. Yeah. Like, I'll tell you right now, Mark, I've traveled around the world and gone to a lot of different mosques and you will sit down next to people you've never even met before never even seen and in you won't even speak the same language but you already you feel a connection with each other yeah and you automatically feel like you know you would support the other person you don't really get that with any anybody else you know it's it's something i think maybe because you all have the same values the same Mm -hmm. you know i mean if you're practicing islam anyway you have the same values the same sort of way of life you know so it's almost as if um you share a similar personality in a way um so you you join the brotherhood now alhamdulillah um thankfully uh, as well were you worried at any point of the night that you'd go back to the car park and your car would have been blown up <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. it was it was it was interesting though the i mean uh, it's a something something as simple as a hug right all those boys getting up there was it different to you had you i know you've never experienced it before was it something you could ever imagine or fathom no n- never growing up i'd I- never ever even think of imagining anything like that mm. just That's incredible cool. what did you feel i just felt happy i know just everything was going through my head at that point alhamdulillah man probably felt some sweat as well <laughs> let's stop going to that <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah man why'd you have to say that <laughs> i know full ruin the moment sorry yeah. mark forgive me well brother. done he always does that so <laughs> <laughs> anyway so mark or adnan um what's what's the plans for for nowadays like now after the event's over um I guess I was giving you some nasiha before to sort of take your time like with the the prophet with his companions he would sort of uh like um, help them build their Islam in stages so they'd you know build a base up first so they could um, it's sort of like when you're molding a metal you take your time in stages to to make it stronger and stronger so I guess what's your plan now to uh, in your life I guess because this is a big um, change that's yeah. come to your life so what's what's the plan now plan just like get my iman stronger like just do everything for the sake of Allah so I can build that up like learn how to pray properly, learn how to speak Arabic so I can read the Quran. Ah, mashallah, man. Would you have any advice for people who are maybe thinking about Islam or who... Uh, well, I'll ask you in two stages. For those who um, have... Uh, obviously, we get a lot of bad bad news in the media about Muslims. You know, there's a lot of this negative hype. Would you have 
any sort of um, words for those people who have this negative view of Muslims? No, like, you just don't judge a book by its cover. you got to read and research. Like, if you read and research, like, it's nothing like that, to be honest. Everything's, like, a lot different once you learn about it more. Like, okay. before, I, I had that kind of view. But then once I started reading about it, everything, like, it just became oh, man. better to me. Well, so what would you say to somebody who's actually thinking about Islam or, you know, reading into it, you know, that sort of just thing? Just keep reading into it, like, make more sense of it first, understand it, before you don't, like, don't just rush into it. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be full, uh, full-heartedly yeah, into, it, I guess. You got to be sincere before you. Yeah, for sure. It. Well, with, with my dad, it was a similar story to yours. Like he was um, just a couple of years older than you. He was nineteen when he became a Muslim, and he went through. Uh, he was a very strong atheist at one point as well, and then he ended up researching into different religions. Ended up finding Islam, found that it answered all his questions logically because he's a very, very logical sort of thinker, and he ended up becoming a Muslim that way as well so i guess it, it, like it seems like muslims have a very bad uh <laughs> they're very misunderstood so they're very bad pr at the moment but like uh brother adnan or mark uh, as he's also known said you know just read into it not only that like what you know how you said when jamal asked you um about the negative hype of muslims what what did you believe before i'd be interested to know before i didn't like just walking in the street seen a person you think like because like you see the stereotype levels out there <laughs> it's like they're just in gangs and stuff yeah and like i like you don't like really get to know the religious type yeah it's like you just stereotype muslims like yeah. in a group where it's it's not like that yeah so your views weren't that extreme like terrorist extreme no, more terrorist extreme. yeah like more stereo- stereotype lebo yeah. thug sort of view yeah but for those, for those who think, uh, if there's any listeners who think Muslims are terrorists, I actually had another friend who thought that until uh, he went to the masjid and came outside and his car wasn't blown up. <laughs> so it sort of enlightened him a little bit there. He questioned <laughs> a bit more and uh, ended up becoming Muslim. So, you know, don't believe the hype on the media. It's, mm. all, it's all bull. Yeah, it is. And we can't put it any more clearer than that. <laughs> um, Mark, you know how Jamal was talking about how his father sort of logically found Islam? Yeah. Just quickly, like... What what made sense to you? What parts of Islam did you that tick the box? You thought, you know what, that makes sense. Uh, things that like that are written in the Quran that scientists uh, scientists are only proving recently, mm. like that's just crazy things like that. Like how to spin out for even us, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like how um, the Quran says like how the baby is formed and stuff, mm, it's and like yeah. scientists only figuring that out like recently. It's things like that, they're just it, like it's impossible to know it back then you know mm. what i mean even some of the the prophet sunnahs uh like so for example he he would uh use honey as a form of medicine and nowadays it's sort of proven that that like it's a very strong form of uh like me- that you can use in medicine for healing wounds and so forth and uh, things like um there was also research going into the black seed which he said was a cure for all diseases except mm. death and there was some research um, into that which actually showed that it was a cure for a lot of different things. Uh, so for cancers and so forth uh, in, in certain stages. So um, I think, like, we're, I guess we're getting a feel from you that you got a lot of your sort of light from the Qur'an. Did you have any, what was your perception of God? Was it, did you, had you always known God to be just one God or was that something that, you know, you found with Islam? Growing up, like, I, I didn't really even believe in God. Like, I just thought it was just, like, earth and that was it. Then once I got to Christianity, I thought there was only one God, but they kind of put, like, Jesus and the Holy Spirit into, like, one whole thing, and that just, like, it didn't feel right. And then when I became Muslim, the one God thing made sense to me. There's a couple of sheikhs who I'd probably recommend. Um, one of them used to be a minister, another one used to be a Bible scholar. And they, like, really sort of, when you listen to their, how they came into Islam, they go along the same lines. But, um, you know, it's sort of amazing, I guess, to see how they came from one extreme to, well, it's not really an extreme, but, you know, from one religion to, to another. It's quite interesting. Hmm. How about, um, so you said the scientific miracles in the Qur'an, the concept of God, 
How about the prophets? Have, what did have you heard anything about the Prophet Muhammad before you were Muslim? Oh no, not really. I haven't heard anything. I didn't hear anything before I turned Muslim. No. Was it the character of the the brothers that you were hanging around with that yeah, also helped one. helped out? Because yeah, like yeah. say in in Southeast Asia, that's how Islam actually came to the yeah. Muslims there. When I was like hanging around these uh, really religious Muslim brothers, like. I don't know my character started changing almost instantly. <laughs> like I just became a better person. And I figured like it was just right. Oh, man. That's a good reminder for our listeners. Um, character, subhanAllah. And we know like in the Quran, Muhammad came subhanAllah. down to perfect character. So it's amazing how character, just someone's behavior and attitude and the way they act in public can have an effect on you. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. You had a lot of Sahaba actually, uh, sorry, companions back in the day who ended up becoming Muslim because of the character of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And people still today who never met him become Muslim because of his character. His character. It's very important. So. And smiling's a sunnah as well. <laughs> so you, you want to see start smiling yeah. now, Mark? Well, you'll learn a lot of, lot of amazing things uh, now that you've become Muslim. So yeah. um, best of luck to you. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, keeps um, helping you become a better person in all ways. And it was... And just finally, before you go, um, to all our listeners out there who were present on the night... Um, you know, on the night that you converted to Islam in front of those, you know, the thousand odd people and for listeners who, who weren't present on the night, what would be your final message to them, Muslim or non-Muslim, just about your experience? Uh, it was an amazing experience, like you had to be there to experience it. Uh, if it ever happens again, I would like encourage you to go. It's just an amazing, amazing performance. Beautiful. Well, Inshallah. I think we'll, we'll play that nasheed that uh, affected you so much. It was called "Don't Don't uh, Call Me Muhammad." Did you say? Uh, I think by Dawood. I remember. I know who he is. Well, don't talk to me Ali. about Muhammad. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that's yeah. it. All right, beautiful. We'll, we'll play that. Inshallah. All right, we'll, uh, it's been a pleasure, Mark. Yeah, Mark. Uh, Jamal, do you want to hug him? Or? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry, off bro. We air. know you got hugged, but we have to <laughs> hug you. Off the air, Mohammed. Right? Off the air. Zakhlo <laughs> Khairan for coming. We really appreciate your time, bro. Thank you. And don't forget, you've got one point. How many Muslims in the world? 1.5. 1. 1. Some say 2 billion, actually. Okay, you know what? We'll, we'll hit the middle gr- ground. 1.8 billion <laughs> brothers and sisters out there for you. If you need anything, money, resources, help, advice, we're all here to help you, inshallah. Thank you, may Allah reward you. Inshallah, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. The Y Factor. Rishwani, I'm so hungry. Bro, you want to go for another Macca's run? Guys, get yourself some proper food. Go to Flame Steakhouse Pizza and Ribs in Campsie. They've got awesome food, awesome prices, awesome service, awesome decor. And on Thursdays and Sundays, they've got specials where you can get $10 pastas, $10 pizzas, and 20% off everything. They source the freshest ingredients for all of their food, the juiciest steaks, and the tastiest ribs you'll ever have. Man, that sounds delicious. Where is it? Go to 396 Beamish Street, Campsie, and to book, go to flamegourmet.com.au or call 9718 4961 because they get booked out like a madman. Now, just before we go, I'd like to give an official shout out to Maan Akul on behalf of the Y Factor team and congratulate him on his Fatiha to Hanan in Melbourne. He's actually flew down from Melbourne for the Fatiha this weekend on the Saturday. Maan, you're an avid listener. You love the program. You're always commenting on the Facebook page. We love you and wish you all the best. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your Fatiha with Hanan, inshallah. And may you live happily ever after and have children who continue to listen to the Y Factor, inshallah. Also, on these couple of weeks leading up to uni this week, and next week are the O weeks and O days for all the MSAs right across Sydney. For all young Muslims making a transition from high school to university, make sure you attend your university's O day and O week. Next week, we're going to do a special segment on how O week went and how O day went. So make sure you attend them t- to get to know about your local MSAs, about the Musalla, the halal food, all the events and services available to you on campus. O week is happening, guys. Get out there and get active. The Y Factor. It's been an absolute pleasure this week. We'd like to thank our fabulous restaurant who supported us for our launch. That's right, Flame Steakhouse Pizza and Ribs. Awesome, awesome. Please, first. please go there and try their cheeseburger pizza. Oh, it man. Absolutely. I've heard about that. Everything, you know? everything on their menu. I actually, I spoke to Valid, the owner, right? I go, what's good on the menu? What's awesome on the menu? 
He goes, well, we used to have a bigger menu, and then we downsized it to just everything that was awesome. So everything on the menu is awesome. <laughs> and it's such so a every time I've gone there, whether it's like trying, uh, I've tried like maybe ten different types of dishes, and all of them. Yeah, are really, uh, yeah, really I know. Good. Every time oh, that explains you know. your weight. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was a low blow. I love you, Jamal. Oh, yeah, 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 you're course. not being forgiven for that. One. <laughs> <laughs> you have to buy me some protein, and then I'll forgive you. <laughs> I'll, sh- I'll show you some flame. <laughs> yeah, all right. You know, honestly, though, guys, go try it out. It's a great place. Great prices, great food. Great. Keep up we're, the we're discussions we're on our Facebook page. We love it. It's yeah. getting feisty. It's getting theory yeah. within Islamic parameters, yeah. of course. Go to Flame tonight. They got specials on on Thursday yeah, and actually, Sunday nights. Yeah, Thursday night. Finish watching, uh, listening to this. Jump down the highway. Get down to that place and eat. Three ninety six. We're going to get sacked off the air if we go past our hour. So we're going to have to wrap it up. This All has right, been guys. a very exciting episode. It we has. had Mark Evans, the convert from when the man who changed the world. And Sister Fatima from Soda doing fantastic work on the ground in Somalia. Rashwani's rant. Rashwani's rant about the PM and her. It was a long one. Her little saga <laughs> with Mr. Mr. Rudd. And yeah. what else did we have? And, uh, you know, Miss Kila, the Franga from Laila. All, right. uh, All right, Mr. Rashwani. Mr. Rudd. Uh, John Howard's in the house, I guess. We should have yeah. had Mr. Howard on the show today. But All right, guys, let's end it off. Let's give our salams, and right, we will no see worries. everybody next week, inshallah, on The Y Factor. On 87.6 FM.